to Damascus, from Florence to Samaria, holy places are reserved for the scattered remains of a body believed to be John the Baptist. These fragments have been worshipped for centuries. Far from Europe's civilized centers, from a desert populated mostly by nomads, comes a discovery which may shake the Church of Rome. A remote monastery of the Coptic Church holds a mysterious link to John the Baptist. Its monks still practice ceremonies which date back to the very time of St. John. Here, never before photographed, is the underground vault which concealed an amazing burial. Could isolated monks have found the real bones of John the Baptist and cast doubt on the claims of Rome? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Sealed by the Vatican in a gold and silver case, this relic is believed to be the actual mummified head of John the Baptist. In Catholic tradition, every altar must contain a relic. Relic has a specific meaning, part of the body of a saint. From the smallest piece of bone to bottles of blood, bits of clothing, limbs, or an entire body, relics have always performed an important function. Before a person can be declared a saint, church officials must determine if his or her relics have inspired a miracle. This small fragment, about one inch square, is believed to be part of the jawbone of John the Baptist. Many relics of John are displayed in Florence. Teaching there is an American professor of art and theology, Michael Petruccioni. Now when we walk in as foreigners to a European church and see the head, the arm, the leg of a saint, it disgusts us, but we forget that the teachings of Christianity are that the body is not important after life, the dust to dust. Many display cases are works of fine art. This reliquary contains what may be John's right index finger. What is the value of a relic to a traditional Christian? There's no value of the relic in itself. And the teachings of the church are that one looks at a relic not in veneration of the piece of bone, a piece of flesh, or article of clothing, but to remember, through the example that comes to one's mind, for example, with St. John, of his great dedication to Christ, his careful following of the new order as established by Christ, that the Christian then has a good example. To remember, I must be like St. John, and that's why that relic is there. Throughout Europe, magnificent cathedrals were constructed to house these remains. Statues of John stand in almost every public square. A mystery in his own time, John was an even greater enigma after his bloody execution. It's rarely mentioned that John the Baptist and Jesus were second cousins. According to the New Testament, there is a fascinating parallel in their births. Mary, young and virginal, was told by an angel she would bear a child, Jesus. Mary's cousin Elizabeth, old and barren, had been told by the same angel she would have a child, John. Christians believe John was the last prophet of the old order and Jesus the first of the new.
As a young man, John went to live as a hermit, dressed like the old prophet Elijah in animal skins. The son of a high Judaic priest, he could have enjoyed a life of wealth and prestige. His food was locusts. It's not common knowledge, but five varieties of locust are kosher, and two are non-kosher. A better source of protein than beef, locusts are also free of disease and parasites. For a desert dessert, John ate wild honey. Rumors spread about this strange, wild man. People asked, are you the prophet Elijah who promised to come back from the dead? Are you the Messiah? John replied, I am a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing a way for the Lord, making straight in the desert a highway for our God. There have been a number of speculations as to why John may have gone into the wilderness. Perhaps the ro most romantic one tells of his rejection as a lover by Salome and him going into the wilderness to uh, get over his thwarted love. Gerald LaRue is professor of religion at the University of Southern California. Another idea came when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. It was suggested that perhaps John had been a member of this Essene or Dead Sea community and had left and had gone into the wilderness to proclaim the kingdom of God on his own. But again, there is no definite evidence of this, no roster of membership and no concrete way to link John to this community. There is a better explanation and it fits into the Jewish tradition. From time immemorial, Jewish holy men had gone into the desert to find the way of God. We have the example of Moses and Elijah, and there's no reason why we can't speculate that John, following in that tradition, went out into desert places, not only to find God, but to proclaim the way of God. John began to preach the coming of the end of the world. He expected the prophecy of Isaiah would soon be fulfilled, that every valley shall be raised up and every mountain leveled. John performed ritual bathing as a sign of repentance. This rite came to be called baptism, and John was named the Baptist. Among the thousands who flocked to the River Jordan, John's younger cousin, an unknown carpenter, Jesus of Nazareth. John said Jesus was the promised Messiah, and the Christian religion began. A few months later, John denounced King Herod for the sin of wife swapping, and John was arrested and dragged before the king. Surprisingly, King Herod listened to John's preaching. The queen, Herodias, however, had no intention of losing her influence to a desert prophet. Using her daughter Salome, the queen tricked Herod into promising her anything. And she demanded John's head on a plate. Christianity spread throughout the world, John was revered as the first Christian martyr. A search for his remains began in the early centuries of the new era, 
and may have just ended in a remote Egyptian monastery. Is it possible that the remains of John the Baptist were smuggled for safekeeping somewhere into the Egyptian desert? The Sahara has been called a land without time. To those who live here, the first century is yesterday. Near an oasis called Wadi El Natrun, monks of the Coptic or Egyptian Orthodox Church still follow a tradition which began with John the Baptist. Each of the monks at one time in his life retreats alone into the desert. The new hermit may not see another human for years. As strange as this life may seem, many of the monks claim it gives a feeling of limitless freedom. For millennia, the oasis has been a gathering place for holy men. Near broken tiles and ruins from the dim past, the Coptic Church built the monastery of St. Macarius in 360 A.D. Every day of the year, the monks of St. Macarius follow the demanding discipline which regulates their lives arising at 4 a.m. and praying until dawn. Father Jacobus El Makari came here in 1969. Before taking monastic vows, he was a professional architect and was therefore assigned to supervise maintenance on the monastery. What was to become a most unusual detective story began with routine renovation. Because the old church was not sufficient for the new uh, increasing number of the monks, they began excavating a debris of about one meter height. We began digging because we must build a strong foundation for the new constructions. The grounds had to be enlarged and cleared of tons of rubble. Several times since the fourth century, the monastery had been sacked by marauding tribes, then leveled by an earthquake. Buried in the debris, hundreds of old columns, some still showing intriguing fragments of names. Sixteen centuries, however, had eroded most of the information. One source of information had not decayed over the years, oral history. In this secluded monastery, the practice of memorized verbal history has strong roots. Father Jacobus heard the older monks reciting a story which had been told and retold for 80 generations. According to this account, the bones of John the Baptist had been brought to this monastery and hidden somewhere on the grounds. Until this decade, however, no one had tried to find them. Jacobus began sifting through old Coptic texts to see if other accounts would corroborate the oral tradition. According to several independent sources, the bones of John had been smuggled out of the Holy Land to Alexandria, where for a time they were safe from desecration. Jacobus read that in the 10th century, the bones were secretly moved again to the monastery of St. Macarius. He searched the books for mention of a specific hiding place. None was written down. Could the monks have been walking over the remains of St. John somewhere on the grounds? Then, a clue. Most Coptic churches have small satellite rooms called sanctuaries for celebration of mass. These sanctuaries are named for various saints, 
and Coptic tradition regarding their placement is normally very strict. In any church, if you wish to build or to consecrate a sanctuary for St. John the Baptist, it must be to the south of the main sanctuary. But here in the church of St. Macarius, you see the opposite. The sanctuary of St. John the Baptist is to the left side, to the north. Why? In the dim past of the monastery, someone had broken the ironclad Coptic tradition and built this sanctuary of St. John to the north. As the restoration approached this area, Jacobus could sense something special might be uncovered. Perhaps the actual remains of St. John? The monks realized their search was treading on fragile glass. Since the irreparable split between Catholic and Eastern Christianity 900 years ago, much blood has been spilled over far less important relics. They knew the Eastern Church would hesitate to challenge Rome's claim of the true remains of St. John. If the bones were here, maybe it was best to let them lie in an unmarked, unknown grave. Jacobus ultimately decided to trust in God and seek the truth, regardless of political consequences. monks had hinted at a special link between a small column in the unique North Sanctuary and John the Baptist. Then, another custom peculiar to this monastery. It had always been a tradition to offer incense to St. John near the base of that same column. Finally, excavation work began in this area. It may be only coincidence, but the monks emphasize that what happened next took place during the most holy season of Lent, during a period of intense fasting and prayer. Eventually, it happened that when we began the removal, uh, we found a wooden box. The casket, which they removed and respectfully covered, held the remains of an 18th century patriarch. Under the casket, however, was a much more startling find. In an older layer of dirt, they uncovered a burial vault, and in the vault, skeletons, placed according to very old custom in bare earth with the head towards the west. There's no way of proving that bones belong to any particular individual. Uh, I suppose we could carbon date the bones, and that would tell us the period they came from, and would perhaps prove that they were not John the Baptist bones if they came from a different period. But uh, even if they proved to be from the John the Baptist period, there'd be no way of identifying them precisely as the bones of John. I don't think the importance of the bones lies in whether or not we can prove precisely that they belong to John. They may, they may not. What is important is what these bones as a symbol mean for believers. Here is a place of pilgrimage, here is a place of renewal of self, here is a place of identity with the past. And when people come here, they don't worry about whether scientists can prove these are John's bones. They are concerned with their faith and what this does to them. This is the first film ever taken of the cleared vault, which has been preserved as evidence of the discovery. A modern reliquary was carved to house the bones. They are now wrapped in a special ritual cloth, which is never unrolled and covered according to Coptic tradition with a handful of dust. After the bones were found, 
the Coptic Pope made a special journey from Cairo to study the question. He advised the monks for the time being not to formally announce their discovery. Jacobus and his brothers obeyed. They have avoided seeking any publicity. Until this In Search of program, no substantial film report has been made about the monastery's discovery. Is this the final resting place of the wandering prophet of the desert, John the Baptist? If so, one small band of monks have dropped a stone into the well of history, and waves will inevitably spread from this monastery beyond the borders of Egypt to the Holy Land, Rome, and the entire world. Pilgrims from around the world now visit the monastery of St. Macarius. Groups travel to this isolated religious outpost to worship what they deeply believe are the relics of John the Baptist. When you visit the church and when you come to the relics themselves, you feel by a mystical element that there is something uh, spiritual in the matter. When you come to the coffin themselves, you shall find it is impossible for you not to believe. How? It is not a matter of the mind, but it is the matter of the heart and the faith. <laughs> 